Perfect. Um, however, everybody, I know that it is being recorded, but this is this is going to work interactively. So don't, you know, don't go uh, to sleep for thirty minutes and come back because it's going to be hard to <laughs> not to understand what comes next. Can you uh, also click on the got it message that's now overlaying your slide? I'm sorry. Ah, this one. Yes. Okay. Actually, okay. I think that's oh, here. Or maybe you need to do that locally. Somebody no, needs to here. do that. <laughs> do what? Sorry. I don't see any message. You're fine. You can continue. Okay. Um, so qubits can be physical. <laughs> qubits can be physical devices. They can be this unit of information that we will use. And they can also be a specific state. So for our laser uh, light, we can modify it, you know, using these corridors, using these uh, chips or lenses and mirrors, we can modify it so that it looks like the image at the bottom. So it's a specific state of light. Um, it's like saying not only red light, but it's just like a, a, a very special kind of color of light. Let's call it a color. Um, so this so is. Does, is there a limitation on the type of light that you are using? Because um, I know earlier you introduced that, you know, you're using laser light. Um, are there limitations on the wavelengths of the type of light that you're able to use for, you know? Good the, question. So our systems are optimized for light that um, functions well with the fiber optics that we use. We use a lot of fiber optics and fiber optics is uh, set to work well. I think it's at uh, 1550 nanometers, I believe, I'm not sure. But whatever the wavelength is for the light that you know uh, the fiber optic is optimized for, that's the one we use. It's not a hard limitation. We could, in theory, we could work with something else, but since those uh, fiber optics are optimized for this light, this is the one we use. Mm -hmm. So qubits are a unit of information. It can be a physical, you know, hardware thing you can touch. Um, and it can also be a specific state of that light. Now, for now, we will focus on qubits as a unit of information. And uh, as a comparison with bits, a bit is uh, one or zero. It can be a coin, it can be heads or tails. Um, and a quantum bit, a qubit, can be a coin rotating in the air. And it has a certain probability of landing on heads and a certain probability of landing on tails. Uh, you can also think of it um, you, you can also think of qubits as like a, a dimmer with colors as opposed to a switch, right? So your classical computing is based on switches, it's based on transistors. Um, instead, a quantum computer is based on the quantum equivalent of a dimmer with colors. And so it has a lot of like, the math itself is completely different. You have to express it in a different way. Um, but it also gives you an idea of the potential, right? So you're not limited to ones and zeros. You have like a way larger computation space that you can explore and use. I have a question. We yes. have a question in the room. If you can project up, uh, just okay. speak loud. Okay, yeah. So for the qubits, do we use like uh, hydrogen atoms or can we use higher level elements as well, like with a higher atomic mass? Um, question so for for these for the physical qubits there are different technologies and we will uh, I'll, I'll have a couple of slides on the hardware the physical qubits with what with different uh, specific technologies but the I haven't seen any that works with hydrogen atoms maybe the question is uh, pointed towards can you simulate hydrogen atoms you can simulate hydrogen atoms. You can simulate small molecules, yes. 
Uh, but these qubits themselves, they are, I haven't seen any that are made of hydrogen. They are made of uh, silicon, they're made of light, they are made of ions, well, trapped ions, but I don't think they use hydrogen. Um, they use neutral atoms. Um, I'm actually not sure anymore. Maybe there are some that use hydrogen. Um, but I, I can check. Actually, let me check uh, about which ions are used in trapped ions. I hope this answers the question. Yeah, does that kind of yeah. clarify? Also, before you continue, yes. the talk was actually, or the, the start of this uh, uh, tutorial was was, announced, was in the program at 1.30. So a fair number of people in the room arrived in the last 10 minutes or so, and may have missed the beginning. I don't think you should start all over again, but you may get questions that you already discussed in the beginning. Because we have now, what, 15 14 people? 14 people, yeah. We went and, from three yeah. to 14, so. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, I know that there was this uh, confusion. Actually, I, I will go back. I haven't gone very far. So I will go just very quickly. Good question. First, okay. I am. Slides going to be sharing. Um, will you be sharing your slides um, later, Catalina, or? Um, yeah, I think I think that's okay. I can share my slides, yeah. Oh, so the whole thing is recorded as well. So it, if you watch the recording, it's even better. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm an engineer. I'm not an XPC expert, but I do know a thing or two about quantum computing. I actually work on, you know, education in quantum computing, helping people learn. So, um, yeah, that's that's me. Um, there are big problems that we want to tackle. These are problems that are sometimes intractable with a classical computer, or sometimes we can go at them from a different angle and see if there is some improvement with respect to what we do in the classical world. Uh, so for Xanad in particular, we use light. So we use these chips that have waveguides in them. And um, uh, you can think of them as corridors where the light can go and change its shape. Um, we are a Canadian startup based, uh, based in Toronto and we're focused on building quantum computers that are useful and available to people everywhere. So the usefulness parts comes from the hardware, from uh, making them bigger, uh, more performance, higher quality. Uh, and the availability part is also um, making people, helping people be able to use quantum computing in general, the field itself, um, helping the development of new applications uh, that can help the field as a whole. This is, um, a really a two part mission. Um, and for this, we don't work on our own. We work with a huge ecosystem. Um, and this is why I'm also very happy to be here with you today, uh, to be able to, to talk about what we do to, and to help to find those industry use cases or those specific research applications. This is a field, a domain that is very much in research and blooming and booming. <laughs> um, we work with a lot of industry partners uh, in the automotive space because our main application focus is on development of new batteries. So very interesting if you're interested in energy, um, very uh, like important for, for energy questions, uh, energy transition, et cetera. Uh, but in order to be able to use quantum computers, you need to understand them. And uh, this requires a whole different math and different way of thinking. And so quantum computers use three main quantum properties, superposition, interference, and entanglement. And they use quantum states, uh, which are uh, a property of qubits. And so here we are at qubits. Qubits can be, uh, they are the fundamental unit of information in quantum computing. Um, but you can also hear people refer to qubits as a physical 
something, right? That's, so it's something that we act on. So these squares, these gray squares in the top right are qubits and we act on those qubits, we modify them um, by um, using gates. And these gates can be applied using the squiggly lines. This is one particular hardware. It's not the one we do at Xanadu. In Xanadu, our qubits are light based. And so the, the shape that you see at the bottom, the graph that you see at the bottom represents a specific state of light. And you can imagine it as a kind of a very complex coloring of that light. You can imagine it as that. And so we can use the specific type of light to do computation. So the example I, I mentioned before, which I really like, that question was excellent, is, is if you have sunlight, you know, it's very nice and everything, but you cannot really send information through that sunlight, like the internet. Instead of you have fiber optics and they have laser light going through it, then you can send information and you can have the internet. In a similar way, uh, when we modify that light and we make it have this specific state, then we can use it for computation. And um, this becomes our, our information. We can, we can use this for information. Now, the ball that you see on the left, the sphere that you see on the left, helps us to define the mathematical representation of qubits. Because qubits are not zero or one. Uh, they, they work in a different space. Uh, and so we will go a little bit into the math of what qubits are. And so if you look at them in the sphere, qubits are basically a point in a unit sphere. Uh, the easiest kind of qubits are on the surface of the sphere. So we will focus on those for now. Um, imagining qubits as a point on this unit sphere. And so let's talk about the math of quantum computing. And I'm not going to go too deep. These are just a couple of slides that are important in order to in order to understand what we're doing and how we communicate about this. Because my goal is that you leave today uh, with the energy to keep um, doing quantum computing. And so you will hear about these things. So these are the, the zero on one of quantum computing. The zero ket, one ket, zero bra, and one bra. So basically, we're going to work with vectors. We're going to describe our zero and one like a coin heads or tails. You can imagine them as a, a vector. So our zero ket, which is described by a vertical line and like this um, um, right angle. <laughs> Um, symbol um, with the zero in the middle. This is how you describe a ket. And our zero ket is the vector one zero. The one ket is the vector zero one. And the bra is the angle on the other side. So on the uh, a left angle and a vertical line. And if it's a zero bra, then it's one zero. And if it's one, it's zero one. So you can notice it's the transpose. Um, it's a transpose, it's a, basically these are our definitions. We're gonna work with this. Now you can have something called a bra ket, you know? It's an easy way to remember which one is which. You had the bra, which had the left angle and the ket, which had this right angle. And you have your bracket where we don't put the the line in the middle twice. We just put one. And we say for any quantum state, it has some special properties. So we have a clarifying question in the chat. Um, someone asks if these are two D vectors. Then why is this? Why why are they two D vectors when the sphere is three D? Yes, a uh, good question. So these, these vectors are representing a specific, a specific point. So 
the zero ket is actually the arrow pointing north in the sphere. The zero ket points north in the sphere and the one ket points south in the sphere. And the sphere is a way to represent qubits, uh, but the, the math here in the vectors is really, um, it's what we use really, you know? The, this one is used mostly for education purposes, for understanding the effect of doing something, um, but really it's a, it's a math. So this is the one, this is the one that you should take a look at and care most about. Um, this one is to get a like a sense of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And now you can have any any given um, any given uh, uh, state here. It's um, psi. Any given state is represented as a linear combination of zero and one. And so you have some alpha and some beta, which can be complex numbers. Um, and they are a linear combination of your zero and one. This gives you another vector, alpha and beta. Um, you can translate that. So you can translate all of these to a point in the sphere. But for now, let's, let's focus just on, on the math. Uh, so the ket is defined as the linear combination of zero and one. And the bra is the conjugate transpose. Now, if you multiply them, you get that the, the norm of alpha squared plus uh, the norm of beta squared must be equal to one. So uh, the norm of the vector, this is going to be a vector. The norm of this vector has to be one. And so this is why it, you know, it fits in a unit sphere. The norm is one. Okay. So when you hear that people talk about quantum superposition, it refers to this fact that you don't only have two states like a coin that has heads or tails, you have combinations of that. So it's like having a coin rotating in the air. It's a linear combination. And this is what we call a superposition. All of this math, all of this notation of cats and brass is called the Dirac notation. It's a way to, to talk about um, quantum states, to refer to them and to do math with them. Oh, I see there's a question. Oh, actually I missed one. Mm, how is qubit polarization represented? How is qubit represented by light, by its polarization? Um, it could, but not really. So for our technology, it's not, it's not the polarization. Um, a qubit can be represented as alpha one plus beta zero. Yes. Yes, that too, but um, the... Um, because of the way we have defined things, you know, it doesn't matter if we call one alpha and the other beta, it just, it will be reversed here in the, you know, the vector will be reversed. That's it. Because of how you have defined your vectors one and zero. Alpha and beta complex numbers and can be represented by phi and theta in a unisphere. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. They can represent be represented by phi and theta. Mm-hmm. Okay, so this is a little bit of math. Now, superposition was one of the main, one of the three main um, quantum properties that we wanted to look at. Entanglement is the one that actually gives quantum computing its power. And so there's a lot of information on the internet about entanglement and at least half of it is not true. So be careful of where you find your information. Entanglement is not um, it's not related to you having psychic properties. It's not related to any of that. It's not um, yeah, it, it it has nothing to do with that. Entanglement is really the fact that there is uh, 
this a kind of correlation between qubits, basically. It's a math thing. It's easy to understand it with a math. Um, when you modify the state of two qubits, you can use something called gates. We'll cover it in a second. Um, to basically join the states of these two qubits. So you no longer have just, you know, one zero or one one in the ket here, in these kets. Oh, you have two. So this represents the state of two qubits. So qubit one and qubit two, um, they can be both in the zero state or both in the one state, but they cannot be in opposite states. So an entangled state is one where the um, where the two qubits have some kind of uh, correlation. Um, they're mathematically connected. So if you know the state of one, you know the state of the other. Uh, so what this means is you don't see something like a zero one here. You cannot have the first qubit be zero and the second qubit be one. If they're entangled, they're either zero, zero or one, one. Now, I'm just gonna say the opposite. You can entangle them in reverse order. So if qubit one is in zero, the other one has to be in one. If qubit one is in uh, uh, in one, the other one has to be in zero. You can do the reverse entanglement. But the point is that the state of qubit, the first qubit determines the state of the second qubit. And it's not, there's no flow of information there's no channel where they talk to each other because of the way you have affected them, because of the way you have basically put them together, they are entangled. This is something that happens at a qubit level. This is not something that happens at a huge level. This is why I make this, um, <laughs> you know, this uh, disclaimer, like half of the information you're going to see online is going to say that there's, huge entanglement and this doesn't make any sense. Entanglement is something that happens at a very, very small scale at the scale of qubits. So you can have one, two, three qubits entangled, something like this, um, but it's not something that happens at a, at a huge scale. If you look at this equation here, you will notice that this state is not separable. You cannot separate it into the component of qubit zero and the component of qubit one, they can, it can only be described together. And so um, quantum entanglement is achieved by, by applying a set of gates. Um, yeah, basically a set of gates. And this can be, has been proven. So um, qubits uh, have been um, created in an entangled state and one sent to the moon and the other state on earth and they maintain the entanglement. So a key component here is, oh, I see there's a question. What about zero one and one zero? Yes, that can also be an entangled state. That is the second one I mentioned. So the point is that the state of qubit zero determines, you know, you can know by knowing the state of one of them, you can know the state of the other. So if you had say one, one and one zero, if you only knew the first one, you wouldn't know the state of the second one because it could be one or zero. So it's not a fully entangled state. Um, entangled states have been, you know, demonstrated, um, demonstrated on hardware. Uh, they maintain their entanglement even if you separate those qubits long distances. Uh, so it has been shown that you can create an entangled state and you can send one of the qubits to the moon and they maintain that entangled state. And so something that is key here is how do you know the state of this one thing, right? Can you, how do you measure it? And so measurement is a key component that comes here. And it's the fact that um, quantum systems, uh, when they're observed, they stop being quantum, they become classical. And so it's like you have your coin rotating in the air, but as soon as you want to see whether it's head or tails, you have to grab it in your hand, it stops rotating, and it becomes head or tail, right? So your quantum state, which was this linear combination of uh, one and zero, once you measure it, it collapses. We say that it collapses. 
to either zero or one. So just one of the, or the two. Um, it, it collapses to a classical, a classical measurement. And so you can do that. Uh, you can send one using lasers to the moon and the other, you can keep it on the ground. You can measure them and you can see that um, the entanglement uh, was there. So entanglement can stay even if you separate the qubits. Um, now, how do you create that entanglement? You use quantum gates. So since you come from the uh, classical world, uh, from the HBC world, I don't know if anybody remembers those uh, and or a not gates, right? So you remember those classical gates that we use to, to act on our, you know, um, to create circuits basically, right? We used gates to create circuits and the same happens for quantum computing, except that we use quantum gates. They're not the same and, or, and not. We do have a not gate though. These quantum gates are matrices. And so quantum computing is a lot about multiplying uh, vectors and matrices. Um, you don't have to do everything by hand. There is software that can help you do that um, to create those quantum circuits that we will cover in a second. Uh, something important here is you're gonna see uh, the symbol called dagger. This is the conjugate transpose. Um, and so um, it can help us define unitary matrices, um, which are the, the base, base of gates, you know, the base of how we do quantum computing. Okay, any, any questions so far? I know that you've been asking them, but I wanna stop here for a second in case somebody else has a question. Yet. Exactly the same, except one penny higher. Sorry? I'm not hearing that question. That person. Okay. Or if you want to make me co host, I can do it too. Um, oh, it's. Let me see. Let me see if I can be co host. Um, if you right click on my. Um... Mm, yes. My co host. Okay. Your co host. Mm, all right. So, basic things to remember there are these vectors that represent quantum states. There is a way to represent a zero. And a way to represent a one. So the on the yeah, here on the left we have how to represent a zero, how to represent a one. We can have a combination of them. We can represent any state with a combination of them, a linear combination using complex numbers. Uh, uh, All you need to do is make sure the norm of that state is one. You can use unitary matrices. And then you can apply them to the different states. And that way you go from a state zero, usually you always start with a state zero, you apply unitary matrix, and then you get to a different state. So, so far it's been a little bit of math, but it's almost over. Um, but really this is important because when we talk about computing and high performance computer, you'll notice that, you know, um, vector matrix products are gonna be important, you know. Um, GPUs, for example, are so well designed for certain kind of computations and uh, certain kind of products uh, can be um, really optimized with, you know, if you understand what is happening underneath. There are, some gates that are particularly important. So we have the X gate. This is the not gate. It's also referred to as a not gate. And when we look at circuits, you're gonna notice that it is represented often as a circle with a like a cross in the middle. These lines that you see going like left and right of the square, 
uh, represent that it acts on a specific qubit. So qubits are going to be represented by horizontal lines. And these kind of squares with an X, with an H, with a Z, that is representing that we're applying a specific gate on that qubit. And so you can imagine this as uh, applying an uh, here a NOT gate, classical NOT gate. The X gate is going to act in the same way. So if you apply an X gate to the state zero, it's going to turn it into a state one. If you apply it to the state one, it's going to turn it into a zero. Um, and if you apply it to something that is in the middle, it's going to um, it's going to modify it to something else. So if we actually go back, if we go back to the to the sphere, this is called the block sphere, um, which we use to represent qubits. And you can think of the X gate as a rotation around the X axis. So if you start in the state zero, which is pointing north, the arrow pointing north, then applying an X gate is rotating that state around the X axis until it points south. That is how applying a gate looks like. The next gate is an H gate or a Hadamard gate. And what it does is that it puts our qubits into an equal superposition. So if I start in the state zero, so pointing north and apply an H gate, a Hadamard, it now becomes a, an arrow pointing in the X direction. So it's, um, an equal superposition, one over square root of two, um, of zero and one. So it's a little bit like this, but except that instead of having zero, zero and one, one, you just have one, zero and one, one, if you're acting on a single qubit. Other gates, the Z gate is a rotation around the Z axis. This um, determines, uh, this can help uh, when you have, um, when you have algorithms that look into the phase, this can be interesting. Um, you can have a Y gate. So the X, Y, and Z are three main gates called the poly gates. And then you have others where the rotation is not only um, 180 degrees, um, it can be any angle that you want. So the X gate rotates 180 degrees in the X direction, in the X axis, uh, but the RX gate can rotate your states any angle that you want. And uh, one very, very important one for performing entanglement between qubits is the C naught gate. So the C naught is a controlled gate. And the control means that however you, um, whatever value is in the first qubit, so in the top qubit, this horizontal line, it will affect the value of the second qubit. So the second horizontal line. If the value of the first qubit is one, then the second qubit gets negated. So it's applying a not gate in the second qubit. If the value of the first qubit is zero, then nothing will happen to the second qubit. This is how it acts. And if this there's some other state, then you know you just um, multiply this matrix by whatever state you want, and it will give you the effect on that on that state. This is a two qubit gate, and so you will notice that these were two by two matrices, while this one is four by four because it acts on two qubits. So the vector representing a two qubit state is a four sized vector, vector size four. Ooh, okay, we've gone through the hardest part. It becomes easy now. Uh, all of the math, or most of the math is gone. Everything that was new math for you is done. So, uh, 
feel free to ask any questions that you have. Um, this was really the hardest part, so I totally understand if you want me to go over it. Any question? Yeah. Quick, quick, simple question. The four factor for the DC now, that's the top two components is the factor of the fur of the top uh, qubit and the bottom two are from the bottom, right? Yep, exactly. Good question. Uh, mm -hmm. I have a question. Yes. Um, why on the block sphere do you have the zero state, the North Pole, and the one state, the South Pole? Because if you treat it as like in a vector space, they're not independent of each other. Ah, uh, yeah. So there is a a mapping that is not perfect from the math to the block sphere. So the zero and the one states are orthogonal, right? One, zero, and zero, one are orthogonal, but they look like they were not independent here because there's a mapping. So there's a, there's a, an over two that you need to add. So in reality, um, they like zero and one, one, zero are orthogonal, even though it doesn't look like it. But this allows you to, to get a sense of what these rotations mean, right? What these gates mean. So this is why I mentioned focus on the math. This is the this is the truth, and the block sphere is a visual representation that can allow us to understand the gates better. But it's not the true math. Yep. Thank you. Great question, by the way. Excellent question. Okay. So. We're now going to go into make how to make circuits. Um, on the right, uh, there's a, a nice nice diagram. We have our artist, uh, in-house artist who makes these. And you're going to notice different elements. So you're going to notice some horizontal lines. You're going to notice some squares. Uh, you're going to notice these like C naught. So these circles with the X in the middle with a you know cross in the middle. Um, this was made by a, a, a designer, so it's uh, it doesn't mean anything, uh, but it can help you understand the main components that make a quantum circuit. Was the requirements a pastel color scheme? This is a Penny Lane color scheme. Yes, uh, you you got it right. The um, you know Penny Lane, which is the main software, it has a very important visual identity, including a color scheme. You're going to notice it if you go to the website. And some of these, uh, yeah, some of these images maintain that color scheme. I'm not a designer, so I, I use it when I remember, uh, which is not always. Mm. So quantum devices are important because we want to be able to tackle different problems. But that means that it doesn't, they need to be used when they need to be used. We're not going to use them for everything. Same as you don't use GPUs for everything, right? We don't use GPUs for everything. So we're going to use quantum devices when it makes sense, special purpose processors. Circuits, as I mentioned, are these horizontal lines. And you can imagine them as time flowing from left to right. So the beginning of these lines is time zero. And as I add stuff to it, so on the bottom, you see these uh, triangles and rectangles and so on. I'm adding gates in an order. So the order matters. It's not the same adding triangle first and rectangle second, right? It's, um, it's not the same as reversing the order. So I am first applying a triangle gate here at the bottom and second, I am applying a rectangle gate. Then I am applying a um, pentagon gate. So time flows from left to right. And each line is an independent qubit. So it can be a, a different physical device. It can be a different pulse of light that has you know, the state that we call a qubit, right? It can be a different pulse of light. It can be a different physical 
something, it can be a different trapped ion. Um, the qubits, so here are their label from top to bottom, zero, one, two. Um, the ordering, again, is important because at the end, you're going to have to get some results and you want to know, you don't know, want to know the answer for qubit zero, you want to know where to look, right? So qubit zero is in the top and qubit two is in the bottom. Uh, there's a question in the chat. So the shapes that extend to more than one horizontal line represent gates like the C naught gate. Yes, they depend on more than one qubit. Exactly, exactly. They're multi-qubit gates. So these rectangles here that act on two qubits, they are two qubit gates. And you could have three qubit gates even. So um, in here, we had many qubit gates. This is more rare. Usually you work with one and two qubit gates, but you can have uh, gates that apply to more. Um, uh, quick, quick question. Uh, yes? What is the significance of all of the various diagrams? Um, what, are you, what is it supposed to uh, express? Yeah, so the first one is showing each line is a different qubit. This first diagram means each line is a different qubit. The second one, so what I was going at next is all of these qubits have an initial state. So notice this zero ket at the beginning of each line, right before each line. This means we're starting in zero. So it's like, you know, you have a classical system. What is your starting point? Where are you starting? I'm starting with a blank slate. I'm starting with zero, it's a blank slate. But I could, if I wanted, start with a one state in the first one. Let's say for some reason, you know, this qubit was in a one state. This is possible and you would denote it by, you know, adding a number one, a one ket at the beginning of the first qubit. So the this, this second image, what it means is you start with an initial state, which most of the time is a zero state. So if it's not specified anywhere, you can assume it's a zero state, but usually we specify it by adding these kets at the beginning, right before the lines. This third image, what it shows is that you have gates, right? You have one qubit gates, you have two qubit gates, and they usually don't have shapes. They're usually not triangles, rectangles, pentagons, and circles, but this is so that we focus on, on the important thing, which is the gates go from, are applied in time from left to right, and they can be one and two qubit gates. There can be more qubit gates, right? And they are different. And here, the last one, what we have is measurement. So you will notice uh, these, you know, the last item in each line represents that the qubits are being measured. And so I mentioned that uh, quantum states, they don't stay in the way you want them forever. They lose the information. They get noise from the environment. They get affected by the environment, whether it's temperature, whether it's people walking around and talking around, it adds noise to them and they lose their information. And so what we do is that we measure the quantum states and then they become classical information that we can keep in a memory, you can process, classical information is going to stay there, you know, forever, forever. Um, so we measure these quantum circuits. We measure each qubit um, in order to, to get an answer, right? So you can measure, for example, the probability of a qubit being zero or one. And if we, if we go back here, uh, this is something important I forgot to mention. The square of alpha is the probability that when you measure the state phi, psi, then the, the, the answer will be zero, right? When you measure state phi, psi, the probability of it being zero is alpha squared, norm of alpha squared, and the probability of it being one is norm of beta squared. I have a question. So, um, the question basically is, 
this probability you get is from multi measurements and not just from one single measurement. The single measurement will tell you it's going to be zero. Then is that true if you then make multiple measurements? That's how you get the probability is that mod alpha squared. So, okay, yeah, I, I said something confusing. When you measure a quantum computer, you get either a zero or a one. So when you measure the first qubit, it's either zero or one, no probability. However, yeah. you can run your circuit many times. You can run the same circuit. It's gonna be it's not gonna be the exact same quantum. Um, you know, it's gonna be a different pulse of light. If you're looking into qubits, it's gonna be a different pulse of light, but you affect it in the same way by using the same gates and you measure it again. And then you do this a hundred times or a thousand times, and then you get an ex an expected value, for example, right? And you say, okay, uh, this was 50 times zero and 50 times one. So it was probably in an equal superposition. However, the measurement that you get from one run is zero or one, that's it. Now, mathematically, we can say the probability of me measuring a zero is norm of alpha squared. And the probability of me measuring a one is norm of beta squared. So if the state psi, if at the end here, if here right after the Pentagon, we have the state psi, then with a probability of norm of alpha square, I will measure a zero. And because I know my initial state, which is a vector, and I know the gates that I applied, then I know my state psi, and I know the probability of measuring zero. And we have one more question from uh, Gerhard. He asks if the physical, or they ask if the physical limits as to how quickly gates can be applied to qubits, or if there are any physical limits as to how quickly gates can be applied, and how about concurrency? Really, really good question. I, I, I love this. Uh, you are really asking the right questions. It depends on the kind of hardware. So, um, in one of the hardwares that I showed you, which is a superconducting qubits, the way you perform these gates is by using um, microwave pulses. And this limits the speed at which you can apply those gates. So for that technology, <sighs> the speed of the gates is, is a, a limitation. It's a problem and it's a, yeah, it's a thing. Now, in the in Xanadu's technology, you use light, and in the computers, um, in our previous generation of computers, the gates were really, uh, really fast, um, and in the new generation of computers that we're building, the gates are applied at the moment of measurement, so they're again very fast and they don't, they don't really affect the system. But in more um, let's say in superconducting technologies and in others, the speed at which you apply the gates is limited by the technology that you use. So if you use microwave pulses to affect the system, there is a limit in the speed. Um, yeah, no problem. And actually, so the question about- uh, I'm sorry. Sorry, it was just number three. Well, could you just go over that one again? I missed. Yeah, of course. Uh, so number three, uh, the diagram here in number three, what it shows is that you have different gates, right? Here they are shapes that are being applied to each qubit. So this whole thing, you know, the last one is a full circuit. The last one is a full circuit. And we're kind of building it bit by little by little. So first we build the qubits, we initialize them, we add some gates to them. And so this is uh, diagram number three, means we're adding some gates to the qubits. And then diagram number four means we are measuring those qubits. Um, and the measurement is you're observing the system it, the physical way of how this happens, again, depends on the specific technology. Um, 
In Xanadu, for example, we have two kinds of measurements. Uh, one of them is using photodiodes. So you can use photodiodes to basically read light. Uh, and so this is our measurement. Um, and you basically get a zero or a one. This is, uh, yeah, it's simple. It becomes simple. Yeah, um, a question from uh, Alfred Tang. Um, he asked, because of decoherence, how many operation can you perform on a qubit before it loses its information? Every single hardware has their own parameters. And even for the same technology, let's say we were doing superconducting qubits, they are developing new um, new chips all the time. And each of them has their own characteristics. So they will have a specific coherence time. Um, they will have specific, um, yeah, characteristics for photonics. Um, for photonics, the coherence is usually not a problem. Uh, the operations are very fast and you could apply, um, I, I don't even know the order of magnitude, but I've, I've never heard of that being a problem. There are other problems, uh, but usually being able to apply a lot of gates is, is not one. There is a limitation. At some point you will, uh, start losing light. For example, loss is a thing, um, but usually applying a lot of gates is not a problem for photonics, but it is a problem because of decoherence precisely. If you apply more than a certain number of gates, then it, there will be decoherence and you'll basically will just read noise here in the measurement. So let's imagine you weren't applying three gates to qubit one. Let's say you were applying a million gates, then by the end, you wouldn't know what you were gonna measure because there's going to be a lot of noise and the state is going to decohere. Um, yeah, that is that is something that can happen. Oh, uh, something interesting as well is here in the last in the last image that we have, we have three gates being applied to qubit one, but there's also kind of a waiting time. You can see there's like a waiting time here in slot number three because it has to wait for this second rectangular gate to be applied between, sorry, between qubits one and two. So these waiting times are also, you have to take them into account. So you would say that the depth, the depth is kind of uh, the number of layers you can think of in your, in your circuit. So if you stacked all of the gates towards the left, what would be um, the number of, you know, vertical columns of gates that you could have. So you would have layer number one, layer number two, layer number three, and layer number four. So the depth of the circuit is four. This is not a very important concept right now, but if you have a very high depth, so if you have a million gates one after the other, it will, uh, your circuit will perform worse, most likely. I'm sorry, could you explain the depth one more time? Yes, of course. So let me go, actually here in the top, in the top right, the depth is zero. We have no gates. So um, basically we just have the initial state and that's it. Now, if I apply a triangular gate to state to qubit zero, right? If I apply a triangular gate to qubit zero, the depth of my circuit, so you don't talk about the depth of a qubit, you talk about the depth of the circuit, is one, because I have one gate. If I apply a second triangular gate to qubit zero, then basically I have a depth of two. If I apply a third triangular gate to qubit zero, I have a depth of three. Now, if I apply one triangular gate to each qubit, what will the depth be? Well, they're not getting extended to the right. So the depth is one. There is um, basically, I can think of, I can make one column of gates. The depth of the circuit is one. Okay, so it's In the kind example of like the, 
logically, you know, um, at the time, I guess maybe you consider the time step. How yes. Yeah, we can think of them as time steps. That is an excellent way of thinking about them. You can think about them as time steps and you can notice for the last one, even though I only have three gates for the first qubit, it really needs, or actually for the second qubit, so for qubit number one, I only have three gates acting on it, but it really has to wait for a first time step because it needs to wait for the triangular gates to be applied, right? Because the triangular gate needs to be applied before the first rectangular one. And so basically this is the one that is the that takes the longest time, right? The hex the um, pentagon, the pentagon can be applied in the previous time step. There's no problem. So the pentagon can be applied in time step number three because it doesn't have to wait for any other gate to be applied. However, the first rectangle cannot be applied before the triangle. So this is why the depth for this circuit is four, because it needs four time steps to be completed. So at the on the on qubit one, if it didn't have the circle gate, would that mean the depth is three? Because you could yeah, exactly. If it didn't have the circle gate, the depth would be three. Thank you. Yeah, no, no problem, and. The exact count of the depth is usually not very important. What is important is the magnitude, right? If the depth is hundreds of gates, this is a problem. Uh, for the problems when I tackle the very hard problem, simulating batteries, um, you have to count the gates in 10 to the something, right? Um, you need a lot of gates. And of course, this is a problem. Um, so this is why we're working on making better algorithms, right? And better hardware. So the exact depth is usually not important. It's more like the order of magnitude that will tell you whether, you know, whether you will have a computational problem there. Okay, amazing. So here is one. Uh, like a different quantum circuit. And now we have the gates that we learned before. So we start with our initial state. We start in zero. We have our qubits, which are these horizontal lines. And our gates are these dots and circles, which are C naught, our controlled not gate. So since the state starts in zero in the first qubit and qubit number zero, then basically the C naught is not doing anything. This C naught is not doing anything because we start in zero, the control is in zero, so it won't affect qubit number I have one. A question. Uh, yes. Are you considering that you start with three, the three single qubits, or is, should I think of that as one vector with six components? It doesn't matter. You can think of it in any different way. They are three single qubits and they are separable. So at the very beginning, so you they can are distinguishable. Think... Yeah, the it's um we call, we call it separable. So basically you describe the state with a vector, right? For this uh three qubit um circuit. Um uh, the example with two qubits is easier, right? Because we have the example of entanglement. So for two qubits, you have the vector one, zero, or the vector zero, one, denoting your zero and your one. If you have two and you put them one after the other, right? And if they're entangled, you cannot separate them. So it's a one, zero, zero, one, and you cannot split them into two, two <coughs> units, uh, you know, two vectors of length two. They are um it becomes a single unity like it, it won't work if you separate them um so for this three qubit circuit you can represent these as individually you can say qubit zero is uh one zero uh, the second one is also one zero they're all one zero um you can um 
you can do the tensor product. So you use the tensor product to, to create the three qubit vector. Um, and it's separable. You can separate them with no problem. However, if you entangle them, then it doesn't become separable. And then you have to treat it as a single, as a single one. But some of your gates entangle them or not? Uh, so it's the combination of gates that entangle. So the here having uh, it's an it's an excellent question. We call these controlled gates, right? So this C naught is a controlled gate, but this gate on its own does not perform entanglement. If you have a Hadamard before and then a C naught, then you have these two qubits entangled. But the C naught, which is a two qubit gate on its own, does not do entanglement. That is an excellent question. It's a it's a combination of gates that give you that entanglement. So with this representation, like the initial state is, I don't know how do you, how do you just like okay, it's one qubit in the kit, right? Can you? How would you describe like if there are more than just one quantum bit for the cat, or is that does that make sense? Yes. So here, before the the same t zero, this is t zero. T zero, uh, we have the state zero zero zero. So you can say it's one vertical line and three zeros, and then right angle. You have the state zero zero zero. Um, you apply this one. The first two are not, they're not affected. The so last question one was with the, the starting state, like instead of it just being, um, the cat being zero, could it be zero one? And, you know, the starting state could be, yeah. So you could have the first qubit being be zero, the second one being one and the third one being zero. You could start with that. Yes. So I was saying like within the first cat, like zero one and or does uh, that no, it cannot be zero one in the first one because this is a single qubit. Okay. So when you have and actually let me go back. Um here. When I have zero zero here, it yes, means that like it, that. there's two okay. qubits. This is okay. a this is not a single qubit. Qubits. A single qubit could be a superposition of zero and one. A, a single zero. qubit can be a superposition, yes. A single qubit, let's say, like this one. I have a single, you know, phi state. It's It can be a superposition of, or of zero and one, and it's a vector that has some components, alpha and beta. But it was still, uh, you know, it's just a state psi. You wouldn't say... It's a state zero zero because this means that there's two qubits there. Okay. This that, means that, that, would, that would be a, a four vector. The this state yes. here. Yes, this one would be a four uh, vector. Or just okay. the, the, the side on the, on the left would, could be a four, I would write as a four vector. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. This would be written as a vector of size four. Thank you. Good questions. Excellent. And also, yeah. just so you know, we are scheduled to have a break in 30 minutes from 3 to 3.30. Perfect. But whenever you feel we can be flexible, like if you want to stop a little bit before that or whatnot, whenever you think you reach a good stopping place, you know, we can do that and just have a 30 minute. Mm -hmm. um, okay, perfect. Uh, let me, yeah, note it. <laughs> note it and uh, we'll... Um, We'll see if we get to a, a good stopping point. I see there's another question here. Do all algorithms require multiple executions of the same sequence of gates to determine probabilities from large number of measurements? Um, or are there algorithms that lead to a deterministic result, i.e. a single they, measurement they, they, is enough they, to determine they, the result? They? Uh, yeah. Um, 
I don't think that's a question. So uh, for the question that was written in the chat, uh, yes, you you have algorithms where um, you only need a single execution to get the answer. Um, you have um, you can have algorithms where you use something called oracles, which basically you you run a specific you you run a specific input, and then the output gives you. Um, information basically uh, the way you encoded your circuit you can get the output in a single in a single run um yeah you this is possible this is possible mm -hmm. not for every algorithm though so there are specific algorithms where where you know this is a thing but I would think that also can only be possible if you start with a very specific initial state. Like here, you start with all zero. So it happens that uh, you start with all zero, but the way you encode your gates, it is performing a an operation yeah. that can give you an answer, right? So. It's the way you encode your problem, you encode it in the gates, you encode your, your solution in the gates, and then you can get the answer uh, from the measurement. It's um, it's like, um, let's imagine your question, let's imagine your question is, um, will, this, uh, will the circuit do superposition? Let's imagine, and then you encode your, your gates and you get the answer and um yeah no maybe this is a bad example uh there are search algorithms there are search algorithms for example that use some things called oracles and it's a very specific set of gates so you have a combination of Hadamard and CNOTS and Toffoli this third one is called Toffoli that give you um basically modify the result in an iterative manner so to maximize the probability, they basically maximize the probability of getting a specific answer. And so depending on what you measure, you get, you cannot know with 100% certainty, but you have a maximized probability of getting the right answer. Um, really good questions. So keep them coming. Now we're gonna, um, Talk about other gates. So our X gates, uh, this performs a rotation. Uh, it means you no longer have the zero state, but you have some other things. So some alpha and beta um, here in, let's say, time step number two. For the last qubit, you will have something else that is no longer zero. For the first two, after the first gate, nothing has happened. Now, after you apply the Hadamard gate, the H gate, you have a superposition. So it's not an entanglement. The H gate uh, creates a superposition. And then this long gate, this uh, three qubit gate, it's called a Toffoli. So it's a controlled, controlled knot, CC knot. And so uh, what it says is that if the last two qubits are one, then negate the state of the first one. Um, so in this case, the second qubit is not one, so it won't it won't affect the first qubit, qubit number zero. Notice how the qubits are usually indexed as zero, one, and two. Um, and the last gate, it's a controlled rotation. So these controls don't only have to be for negation, but also for rotation. So I can decide whether I want to rotate the state of the last qubit, depending on the state of the first one. And so this will give me a specific array of uh, measurements, right? I will have different kinds of measurements that I can perform. Um, and um, yeah, it will give me a different uh, array of measurements, but it will be a classical answer. Uh, after when I measure, I will get a, a classical answer. Um, and the last thing, so something we haven't seen is that in these circuits, you can have parameterized gates. So you don't have to decide 
uh, let's say I always want to run the circuit with an angle 90 degrees. I don't always have to run it like this. I can run it with a specific angle, say this last controlled rotation, I want it to be a 90 degree rotation, but then depending on the answer, I will run the circuit again and I will run it with a 180 degree rotation. And depending on the answer, I will run it again and I will run it with a 30 degree rotation, right? So these, um, you know, these rotations and like these parameters with, within the rotations, um, you know, there you can change them. There you can have parameterized circuits. Um, it's important in like for later to distinguish between whatever is fixed. So I can have fixed numbers there and whatever I will modify when I run the circuit again. Is that modified by the hardware or is that software controlled? Software controlled. So you would run the circuit again, but in a different way, right? So this RY is a specific matrix that depends on the parameter here. And so the software will basically apply a different matrix, a different gate. It can be um, applying a different... Um, it can be applying a different um, uh, microwave pulse, for example. If you're using superconducting qubits, you would apply a different microwave pulse that would help you do this specific rotation. So the hardware acts on it, but the software tells the, tells the value hardware also. what to do. Yep, exactly. So finally, um, I can uh, I can use linear algebra, all of the tools that you already know, uh, because we're talking about vectors and matrices, all of these. So the initial state is vectors and all of these matrices here, uh, all of these gates are matrices. Everything up to the dotted line are just vectors and matrices. And at the end you have a the measurement so this is the part where you're basically getting a projection onto a specific axis or you say you're um projecting onto a specific um, eigenvalue depending on how you're measuring so if we go back to our uh, block sphere again for education purposes remember that this has a mapping with the math you're basically projecting to um, if you're measuring in what we call the computational basis and the z-axis, then wherever your state is, wherever the arrow is in this pointing, um, it will collapse to either pointing to the north of the block sphere or the south, if you're measuring in the z-axis. So if you're measuring the in the poly z-observable, you will either get um, that you're, you have the state zero, which is pointing in the positive axis, positive z-axis, or you're getting the state one, which is pointing in the negative z-axis. You can measure on different axes. So you can measure on the x-axis. Um, and so this is what we would call a measurement on the, uh, on the poly z observable. But the most common measurement is measurement on the z-axis. So if you have a state which is in superposition and an equal superposition, so you start in state zero, you apply the Hadamard. So it moved all the way pointing to the X. Uh, so it's half zero and half one, uh, or well, one over square root of two of zero and one over square root of two of one. So you have 50% chance of getting zero or one in the Z axis, but you have 100% chance of getting in the positive x axis, if you measure based on the x, right? So it depends on how you measure. You can measure on the z direction, on the x direction, on the y direction, uh, and this will uh, this will change the the result of your measurement. So you can again, only do one measurement. You cannot first measure one and then subsequently measure the other direction. Exactly. So for a single qubit, let's say we have a single qubit. You can either measure it in the z-axis or in the x-axis. You cannot measure it in both. Um, 
However, you could measure the first qubit in the z-axis and the second qubit in the x-axis. You can do that. You can measure different qubits in different directions. And so your measurement is basically a projection on this axis. Ooh, okay. So, uh, okay, maybe before there's a question, the result of the measurement are probabilistic. We only do the calculation in a quantum computer once and not thousands of times to get the statistics. Uh, actually, we do often make the uh, calculation many times. You usually don't use the quantum computer just once. You usually, I mean, it depends again on the algorithm. So for some algorithms, you may just need to run it once, but for many algorithms, you have to run your circuit many times and get a histogram of the answers that you get. And then you can get your conclusions from there. So very, very often you would need to run hundreds or thousands of times to get statistics. Um, okay, so closing up the conversation about uh, quantum circuits, why would you even need a quantum circuit? In the short term, you would be able to represent your data, your model, whatever system it is in a different way. And you can increase the representational capacity. So um, the mathematical space for encoding problems is higher, right? You're not talking with zero and one, but a linear combination of states zero and one, and those uh, coefficients, those alpha and beta can be complex numbers. So the space for, of, for running your problems is uh, much larger. And the potential in the long term is to be able to solve these problems either faster or better, right? So it's not always faster. It could be getting to a higher level of precision. For example, for chemical problems, uh, we cannot analyze um, the interactions between electrons um, in complicated molecules. You can only get so far with a classical computer. Um, will we cover a few specific simple algorithms here to see how it works in practice? We will run some examples. So the first examples we will run will be uh, simple circuits. So it's not a specific, no, it's not a specific algorithm. Uh, it's more like how to run a circuit. We're going to build a circuit and how to run a circuit. And at the end, I will show you how to run a, an example on, a, on an HPC system. Um, uh, so the goal, I will show you how to find the algorithms, uh, how to encode them, uh, etc. We won't, um, we won't solve a real problem today. <laughs> um, of course, that takes time, but I can show you where to go where you can learn about these real problems. Okay. Um, so that being said, uh, I think this is a good moment to to take the break. Um, for anyone who wants to run on their local computer, they can pip install Penny Lane if they haven't, if you haven't already, you can create a new virtual environment with Python 3.10, um, at least Python 3.9, and you can pip install Penny Lane. And we will also run an example on the uh, HPC system uh, from NERSC. So, um, if you if you want to run it there, that's also possible. So, um, yeah, you have the option. This is not the exact example that we will run. We'll run a different one, but you can pip install Penny Lane if you haven't already. And uh, then we can take the break. Uh, this, I think, is a good moment to take the break. Okay. All right. Well, we will start back up at 3.15 Pacific then. Okay. Thank you. Great job so far. Yeah, great job, everyone. Good questions. Oh, I see there's, there was another question. Um, yeah, you can, you can run it on your local machine on a simulator. Basically, we'll be simulating a quantum computer. So I'll be back soon.
All right. So I hope this uh, break didn't help you forget everything. Um, let us go back to um, go back to the topic. Now we're gonna go through a demo. So um, yeah, just let's remember we're going to be building a quantum circuit which takes uh, some quantum gates and then we perform a measurement and get some output of that. This is basically what we will be doing right now. So if everybody has already installed a uh, penny lane, go ahead. I'm going to uh, open a new environment. Um, you can, so is everybody using their local computer or is anybody using their, um, the NERSC system? Were you meaning to share your screen yet or? Oh, I haven't started sharing, started sharing. Everybody's using their local computer. Or are they using the NERSC system? I think it might be a mix. Um, OK. All right. Most people are using their local computer. So I'm going to start with that. Let me, let me activate my local environment. OK. And we're going to create a Jupyter notebook. I'm going to start. Uh, sharing now. Mm, okay. Uh, actually, actually, I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm gonna share it once I have my Jupyter notebook running. So everybody, just write, uh, Jupyter notebook, right? Um, we still can't see your screen. Were you meaning to share yet, or? Uh, I haven't shared it yet, so just uh, give me a second Sorry. because I'm uh -huh. going to share when, when the Jupyter Notebook is up. Okay, it's up. So, because otherwise I would have needed to change to stop sharing and again share. So, everybody should be, you know, just write Jupyter Notebook, uh, hopefully in the, in the environment where you installed Penelene, and you should see this. We're going to start with a Jupyter notebook for the first example, and then we're going to go to the NERSC system. Um, okay, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to import our favorite library, which is import Penny Lane. Now, for historical purposes, we import Penny Lane as QML uh, because it was at first built as a library for quantum machine learning. Um, now it's uh, for a lot more than this, but uh, we've got this this signature way of importing Penny Lane. It's also short, nice and easy. Um, the next thing we're going to import is from Penny Lane. We're going to import NumPy as NP. Uh, for this example, we may not need NumPy, but it's important to know that we usually use the Penny Lane's wrapped version of NumPy because we have some special functionality there. Uh, it's not a, you don't have to use it depending depending on how you're coding your circuits, um, but you're often going to see that it's imported this way. Uh, so shift enter, okay. Uh, now that we've imported our favorite libraries, we are going to create a quantum device. So the quantum device, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be a quantum hardware. It can be a simulator. And so today we're going to use a simulator. So we're going to run um, uh, dev equals QML dot device. And we're going to say, oh, I see a question. Uh, oh, you still don't see my screen yet? Um, we see your screen fine. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so whoever asked the question is the only person not seeing it, I guess. Um, okay. So, George, no idea. No idea why you're not seeing the screen yet, but everybody else is. So we're going to use the lightning qubit device. So we're going to do is lightning dot qubit. 
and we are going to specify how many qubits it has. Now the qubits are called wires. So we're going to say wires equals two, means we have two qubits. So you know they're wires because in the circuit they look like horizontal wires. Now, um, okay, we can you can run run this if you want. Um, I'm gonna continue. Now we're going to create our quantum circuit. So our circuits are just Python functions here. We have used Penilane's device functionality to create to an instance of the simulator, the lightning qubit simulator, which runs on your CPU. And now we're going to uh, create a quantum circuit. But we need to tell the program that the quantum circuits needs to run in, in this device. So we're going to add what is a decorator. So at qml.qnode, we are going to turn our quantum circuit into a quantum node, which will run on this specific device. So at qml.qnode. This decorator, this line, goes right above the definition for my circuit. So def circuit my circuit could be called whatever uh, the the name is not important the important thing is that it's right below this decorator and and for now we're going to create a circuit that takes no parameters no arguments because it's a python function it's easy to work with so we are going to add uh, the gates we're going to say the first gate is going to be a Hadamard. So qml.hadamard. And we're going to say it's applied to wires equals zero. So notice how we have two wires, but they are zero indexed. So the first qubit is qubit zero, right? Okay, and now the second gate that we're going to add is a C0 gate. So qml.c0. And we're going to say it's applied to wires equals square brackets 0, 1. So the C0 is a controlled not gate. Um, and we have to tell that which is a control qubit and which is the target qubit. So the one where the negation is applied. The target, the control qubit is the first one that we specify here. So wire zero. And the target qubit is the second one that is specified here. So qubit one. Okay. The combination of these two gates creates entanglement. And so we're going to see that if we return, we're going to return PML dot props. This returns the probability of the state 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1 in this order. Uh, so we're going to see what probabilities we get. And finally, we can run our circuit. So, all right. So we have a 50% probability of getting the state 0, 0, and a 50% probability of getting the state 1, 1. So this is in fact an entangled state because by knowing the state of the first qubit, I know the state of the second one. I know they're both zero or both one. Uh, remember, we could also have the opposites, having them being in the middle. So zero, one, and one, zero reversed. Uh, but in this case, it's zero, zero, and one, one. So we have created an entangled state here. Um, now, how does the circuit look? We can use QML dots draw of circuits. 
Uh, oh, print. I have to print this. Print camel uh, dot draw um, of this circuit. Sorry. Okay, so these parentheses goes outside. Basically, we are drawing the circuit and it has no parameter. So these, this is where the parameters would go. Uh, however, this this drawing is not very nice. It's I mean it's it's fine and it's what we will have to use if you're using uh, the NERSC system. If you're on a in your local computer, if you're in your local computer, you can remove this print and you can write draw underscore MPL. And so you get a nice matplotlib drawing of your circuit. This is the same. Now let me go let me go back to what I had before. Here we have a Hadamard, the Hadamard and the C not gate. This is how it's represented. And here at the end we have get the probabilities. And if we have the matplotlib drawing, here we have the Hadamard gate the control knot, C knot, and the measurements. Okay, so they're both the same. Both drawings are the same. Um, so this is our, our first circuit. You have programmed your first quantum circuit uh, using a simulator, which is our lightning qubit. If you wanted to change the simulator or change the device where you're running, this is where you would change it. So you could change this to default.qubit. So I can run these again. Uh, the output is the same. It's another simulator. It's just a different different simulator, more a more basic simulator. Lightning qubit is built on C++ um, on the, like under the hood, so it's faster. Uh, and I recommend it in general. And it's going to be easier if you want to run stuff on GPU. Uh, so now we can actually, um, we can go to the nurse system. Uh, so everybody should have access. So now that you run an example here, we can run another example on the nurse system. Um, so let me, let me stop sharing and share my, uh, my terminal. So so far, everybody good. How did how did it go for everyone? So far so good. So far so good. Okay, great. Okay, let me connect to my NERSC account. So everybody, uh, go to your terminal. You should have received a username and a password. So so. Okay, so um, is everybody already in? Is everybody logged into their NERSC system? Their NERSC account? Yes, no? We're good to go. Yeah, everybody's logged in. Uh, okay, everybody who's uh, online, you can mention something because otherwise I'm going to keep going and I don't want to, I, I don't know if you're already logged in. Okay, one one like. We log in through the website. Uh, no, you, on your terminal or command line, um, depending on whatever system you have, uh, you have to use your login credentials that were shared with you when you registered. So they can go to our um, this URL as well and log in with their credentials. Yeah. Ah, okay. Okay. You. If there's the URL, then that's good too. It's kind of just an in-browser environment. 
Ah, oh, okay. So ah, oh, perfect. Better. Okay. So, uh, do you already have uh, an environment set for everyone? Or, because I can easily show you how to create one. Go for it. Yeah? Um, okay. Can I get that? Oh, yeah, it's in the, oh yeah. Well, it's just okay. Jupyter that in our stack out. Thank you, no problem. And were you intending to be sharing your screen now, Catalina, or not? Uh, so let me let me share. Yeah, let me share my screen. You're right. Uh, here. So. make this bigger. So I'm going to use uh, module load to the toolkit. So let me copy it here in the chat. Here, I've already loaded before. So, so I won't get a lot of stuff, but you will get something. Mm. Okay, now I will. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. No, okay. I was trying to find the right command, but this is taking longer than actually <laughs> actually doing this stuff. Uh, so sure. let me let me copy it and paste it paste it from here. I'm gonna do. CD P scratch. I'm going to copy it here too. Um, actually, I'm going to copy it all so you can, you can run this completely. So, here, just a couple of commands to create a virtual environment. Uh, yeah, you need to SSH into it into your account. And so if they are able to connect to jupyter.nurse.gov, it basically presents an in-browser environment with a notebook or they can do a terminal and that cuts back on, you know, having to SSH. Mm -hmm. So Hamza, if you can click on the link and you should have gotten a training account to use, I believe. Yeah, everybody should have got a training account. So if you're if you're in a Jupyter notebook, you need to run. Let me copy it here. If in a notebook, you need to run exclamation mark, pip install, and then install Penny Lane, Penny Lane Lightning GPU, and uh, Kustate Vec, uh, which is, um, it is it's a NVIDIA's library in order to use GPUs. Okay. And so we're going to run the command for using GPU. So we have some nodes for using GPUs. So I'm gonna copy it here in the chat. This is a command that you will need. So this will allow you to use GPUs. A shared GPU, a, sh a shared GPU, G GPU is fine. I mean, doesn't matter which one. Okay. 
Okay. Now I'm going to create a new file. So I'm going to create a new file where I'm gonna do a similar thing than what I did just before. So we're going to start by um, import, import any lane as KML and from any lane import numpy as NP. Now we're going to create a device. So dev equals, we're going to start with lending qubit again. Uh, so QML dot device lightning dot qubit and wires. This time we're gonna try a single wire. Wires equals one, so only one qubit. Oh, okay. I see people are in the queue. Um, who is in the queue? Who, who's being able to run this with me? Who's in the queue? Um, react to, you know, you can add a hands up or react or something to let me know that everything is going well. Or if it's not going well, then you can write a message in the chat and let me know if you need some time. Everyone okay in the room here? We're good to go here. Yeah? Okay. Everybody who's remote, make sure to react. They seem to be in the queue. Um, okay. You, okay, you can, you can try this. Um, with Lightning Qubit, it will work the same if you're running this locally. Uh, now, if you don't have an NVIDIA GPU, you won't be able to run the part that is on GPU, um, but uh, you can see how it works. So for now, I'm going to continue, but let me know if I should stop at some point. So we're gonna do a very similar example. Now we're going to have a parameterized quantum circuit. So we're going to have at qml.qno. So again, this is our signature line, which will attach our device to our quantum circuit, which we defined right uh, after. So def circuits, and this time, this is going to take uh, two parameters. We're going to call them phi and theta. Um, now we have rotations. So let's say we're going to use qml.rx. So this is going to be our x rotation. And we're going to use the angle phi to parameterize this rotation. And this gate will act on wire number zero, which is our first and only wire. Remember, we have only one qubit here. Now we're going to have qml.ry. So we have a rotation around the y-axis and we're gonna parameterize it with angle theta. And again, this will act on wire zero. And finally, for the return, we can return something else. So we can return for example, um, kml.expval, this is the expectation value. Um, so it's imagining you, you measure this a lot of times and you get an expectation value. 
uh, on a specific ser observable. So we're going to say we're going to measure on the poly z axis on the z axis for the poly z observable. We're going to measure uh, qubit zero. So here, q the zero means we're measuring wire wire zero, which is our only wire. So this is a different measurement. Um, this, um, yeah, this will give us a number uh, that will be between minus one and one um, because the measurement on poly Z will tell me whether I'm measuring on the positive Z axis or the negative Z axis. Okay, so we have defined our circuit. We have our return value. Let's uh, now execute our circuit. So here, the circuit, it's just defined. It's not running. So we can uh, print the output of our circuit for some specific parameters. We can say we're going to print it for what if both angles are 0, so 0 and 0. Um, and we can also draw the circuit. So we can print gml.draw of circuits. And we have to add again the parameter, so 0, 0. So now we have a parameterized quantum circuit because it receives some parameters. Unlike the case that we had before when the circuit didn't take anything. Okay, so let's close this here and let's run this example. So hopefully don't have any typos, all good. So we see that the output of the circuit, this expectation value is one, so I start in the zero state, so in the positive Z axis, and I rotate with a zero angle on my X and Y, right? So I basically do nothing to it. So I get the same one. So this is something that is not probabilistic. If I have a qubit that is in zero, the zero state, and I do nothing to it, it will stay in the zero state, unless there is some environmental noise that is affecting it. So we have uh, run our first a parameterized quantum circuit. And now we can actually do optimization with this. So I'm going to edit this example. Um, I'm going to edit this example. Um, and we're going to add some optimization here. Uh, so we have some penny lane based uh, optimizers. Uh, based on this uh, NumPy. Here, under the hood, this is using uh, something that we call an interface. So it's using an autograd interface. There are others. You're going to see there are examples using Torch or TensorFlow or JAX, um, all like very interesting and uh, often more performance. So if you're interested in performance, uh, JAX and Jitting will be, will be your thing. But for now, we're going to stick to this, which is simple. Uh, and we can uh, perform an optimization. So we're going to define an optimizer. I'm going to call it opt. And I'm going to use QML.gradient descent optimizer with a step size. Step size, I'm going to say it's 0 0.2, for example. Now I'm going to define a cost function because we need to optimize something. Uh, I see a question. Do we get this code from sources like GitHub? I'm going to show you where you can find these, like not exactly these examples, but examples like these. But these ones are for you. These ones are for the training. Um, so make sure to pay attention anyway, this is recorded. Um, like if needed, I can send these later, uh, but this is really better if we do it here online. So we yeah. have an optimizer. So just send us the, the scripts and we can post it to the event site. Yeah, 
I can do that. I can do that. But this is really more beneficial for you if you do it in line with me. And then you'll get questions and stuff. So we create an optimizer. Now we're going to create a cost function. So I just create a Python function. I'm going to call it cost. And it's going to take, um, I'm going to call it X and Y, which are going to be uh, basically my phi and th uh, theta. And I'm going to return something that can be you know, classical. So let's say I'm going to get mp.apps, which is the absolute value. What's the length on the Zoom the absolute value of the circuit for x comma y. And I am going to square this uh, so that it becomes better. OK, perfect. So we have a cost function. Notice how this cost function is classical. It doesn't have this at qml.q node on top of it. And so this is what makes it classical. It? Finally, um, I'm going to uh, run the optimization. So for it in range 10, so I'm going to have 10 iterations, which is of course a toy problem. No real problem is solved in 10 iterations. <laughs> um, but for this example, I am going to say that the new value for x comma y is going to come from or equals opt dot step. So I'm going to use this function called step, which is part of my optimizer. And this function takes my cost function, my x and my y. Because x and y are, you know, the arguments here of my cost function. And now I'm going to print. I'm going to print the step. It's going to be it plus one because we start at step zero. So, so we know which step. So the step, I'm going to print the cost. And the cost is, uh, cost of x comma y. Um, and I'm going to print, um, I can print x and y. So I'm going to print x. And y. Ooh, okay, we're done. So uh, I'm gonna leave this here. Um, oh yeah, somebody has a an error. Uh, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna leave this here for a second in case anybody is uh, a little bit behind. I can copy it into the chat in a minute. Um, so let me exit, run this, and then I'll copy the code for you. So let's run this example. Now let's see what we get. Oh, I didn't define x. Um, ah, yeah, I need to define an initial value for a good, good thing. So opt dot step here is taking some initial value of x and y, right? So I can decide that my initial value for my initial value for x is going to be, um, I'm going to say x is an mp dot array. And notice how, again, this is the special version of NumPy that came from Penny Lane. Um, and I'm going to use, so np.array, I'm going to say, I'm going to start in some value, uh, let's say 0 0.1. And I'm going to state this as trainable. So I'm going to write 
requires underscore grad equals true. So basically here I'm saying, yes, optimize for X. Uh, give me run the circuit until you get the best X that uh, minimizes this cost function. Same for Y. So Y equals MP dot array of 0 0.1 comma requires underscore grad equals true. All right. So sorry, I missed this very, very important step. We need an initial value for our parameters. So we can now run this again. And you see that I get a cost function, uh, the cost printed here. So the cost starts in 0 0.96 and it gets smaller and smaller until it gets to 0 0.086. And the value for X and Y is changing. So the higher the value, you know, the more the rotation and the more I get closer to, um, to minimizing this cost function. Okay, so let me copy the code here for you in the chat. So for everybody who is struggling or is a little bit late, I think I should be able to copy this. Uh, okay, I, let me check the questions here. So for attendees who are waiting in the queue, you might be in a Jupyter notebook. Instead, use SSH, Perlmutter, and Ascov. Um, we have a reservation with 20 GPU nodes. And uh, so, uh, okay, you'll need to uh, issue uh, the line that I copied before to get a GPU in the reservation. Otherwise, you'll be when in the queue because the request isn't using the class reservation. Okay, let me copy that line again. Mm -hmm. So the line that you needed to copy in order to not wait in the queue is this one. So hopefully this uh, fixes the problem for everybody. So my goal here is that at the end of today, you can get to run different um, quantum circuits in the nurse system. Uh, it's a it's a really good system that you can use. Um, so, I mean, you can leverage. You can have so much compute power there. So leverage it um, to tackle interesting and hard problems. Uh, could we replace the line that installs Penny Lane in the virtual env environment? Uh, yes. Uh, let me let me look for it again and paste it. Mm. So it's this. If you are running this on a notebook, you need to add a, an exclamation mark before. Or you can you can actually do you can actually add also Python minus M before. That's the the better way of doing this. Okay, so um, let me know uh, again. Actually, I see that I can do a quiz. So I will add a quiz here. I think I can. Let me see how I can do this to know how you're doing. Hmm. Mm, no, actually, actually, I don't know how to use this. Sorry. So let me know with your reactions. Let me know uh, with a thumbs up. Uh, if you're doing well, or let me know with a different reaction if you need help. Is everyone okay here? 
okay in the room everybody okay in the room okay great everybody online everybody online we wait for your hands up or okay we have a thumbs up who else okay another one good okay perfect so it seems we're ready we're ready to continue so i'm going to um going to a little bit more slides it will give uh, a break to those who were uh suffering with the um, suffering with the system so we can go back to the slides so you should be seeing the slides again okay perfect uh so your devices you know the ma main thing here is you're going to use a device we can which can be a simulator or it can be um it can be actual hardware so if you change the example if you change lightning.qubit to lightning.gpu you will be using one of the gpus so actually we can do this in a second um we can run the same example on a gpu actually you can do it now if you have this open i'm not sharing my screen anymore but um you can change lightning.qubit to lightning.gpu and the circuit will run on a gpu and you could run this on actual quantum hardware. So if you installed the Penny Lane Qiskit plugin, for example, you could run uh, on IBM devices. For example, this is not the exact code, so you would need a little bit more, but um, this gives you the, the hint. Now let's talk about quantum hardware. Since we can run on different devices, both simulators and hardware, uh, for the person who asked about the trapped ions, are they hydrogen? I, uh, you know, in the break we had it just red and they're not hydrogen. They're group two. So like calcium or ytterbium, um, beryllium and something else that is used as well. So, um, so as far as you know, no hydrogen being used uh, for quantum computing. Uh, we do use light. Uh, you can use uh, superconducting uh, qubits, superconducting circuits. Uh, you can use trapped ions and ne neutral atoms as well. Uh, we have tutorials on all of this. So Penny Lane, as I mentioned, is hardware agnostic. It's, you know, the main the main maintainer and developer is Xanadu, but we don't focus only on the Xanadu technology. This is meant to work across across the different players in the ecosystem. In terms of Xanadu's hardware, as I mentioned, we use light. We use those special GKP states that I mentioned before, um, those wiggly um, lines in the like with the black background that I had before. But we also use squeeze states. So you can imagine the light being like it's on the left. And then by passing that light through those narrow corridors, which are uh, the waveguides in our circuits, then we can squeeze that light. Um, you can do this with other systems as well, um, but we are a specialist in integrated nanophotonics. Um, our hardware, There's a, is there a question? No, okay. Uh, our hardware roadmap has a goal of creating useful quantum computers that have uh, thousands and millions of qubits, but for that, uh, we go step by step. So we still have uh, some quantum computers that are on the cloud. They're small. Uh, they're from 2019, the first photonic quantum computers that were ever put on the cloud. Last year, we made the news, the headlines everywhere. We um, published an experiment in nature uh, with demonstrated quantum computational advantage. This means solving a problem so much faster than what a classical computer would. So in 36 microseconds, we solve a problem that would have taken 9,000 years for a classical computer to solve. This has now been uh, turned off because we're focused on our next, um, our next generation of systems, which are what are, we call our fault tolerant modules or fault tolerant systems. And this is important because quantum computers are noisy. They're not like our classical computers where you say what is one plus one and they answer two. 
If you ask a quantum computer what is one plus one, it sometimes will answer two or three or one. And so we have to devise these systems that allow you to correct for those errors. And so we're in the process of building these fault tolerant modules. Okay. Um, the main architecture has uh, four components. State preparation. This is where we um, prepare our qubits. Basically, we uh, generate those states of light that are interesting for us to do computation. They are not always generated. So it's a probabilistic generation of those states. And so we have a multiplexer that basically takes the outputs that did turn out to be the ones we want. And then the stitcher, which is component number three, it creates entanglement between all of these qubits. And once all of these qubits are entangled, then you go to the quantum processing unit where you apply your gates at the moment of measurement. So this is something that looks completely different from what we saw. This is, you're gonna tell me, but wait, you tell me you first initialize the state, you then apply the gates and then you measure. What do I mean you're applying the gates and the measurement at the same time? This is because of this particular architecture, but it can be represented as the circuits that we just saw. So the physical way of how the quantum computer works, uh, it doesn't affect the, you know, the mathematical representation and the way we code it. So we can code our circuits in a very standard way, and then they are implemented in the actual hardware in like in different ways, right? So the compiler, and then compilation becomes so important. The compiler translates whatever you want to do. So your circuit, the encoding your problem, whatever it is that you want to solve, it translates it so that it can run on specific hardware. Some benefits of photonic quantum computing. They are modular and networkable. We use, uh, I don't know, the fact that uh, fiber optics and silicon processing is so advanced, so uh, it's scalable, it's easy to scale. Um, and it has, the architecture has error correction flexibility uh, native to the, you know, to the way these computers are designed. So this is a little bit about uh, quantum computing hardware. Uh, you, we have, again, tutorials that explain them uh, with pictures, with code, uh, little by little. Um, we have videos as well. And you will see that um, many of the different providers will have videos online of how their hardware works. Um, and you don't really need, I think the key here is you don't need to be a physicist and you don't need to understand the exact movement of electrons and photons and light in the hardware in order to program the quantum computers. It is useful to be aware of how they work, but you don't need to know the exact details in order to use these quantum computers. So it's like most people use a computer without knowing that there are transistors in it, right? A classical computer has transistors and most people can use a computer without knowing the transistors. Uh, so you can think of it as the same analogy. And now we go to quantum algorithms. So who is the person who was asking about the algorithms? Uh, I think this you're going to really like this part. A lot of the algorithms that we work with are called variational algorithms. They are not the only ones, but um, they are important ones and they're good ones to start with. So the example that we coded was an example of a variational algorithm. We created a circuit. We started with the state zero because we didn't do anything. So it just starts in state zero. Um, then we added some gates with some parameters and then we measured. We measured an expectation value. Uh, and basically this is a function of the inputs that the circuit takes. We defined a cost function. In our case, the cost function depended only on a single quantum circuit, but this is not a hard limitation. You could have a cost function that depends on many quantum circuits. Um, and at the end, you, um, 
you're iterating or you're getting a new version of your parameters. So when we had x comma y equals opt dot step of cost x comma y, um, basically you're getting a new version of x and y depending on the gradient. So the optimizer that we used was a gradient descent optimizer. So it was calculating the gradient uh, with respect to x and y, and then it was returning a new value of x and y that would optimize the cost function, that would minimize the cost function. And this is why we started seeing the cost uh, getting printed to be lower and lower. So we just coded a variational algorithm. Um, so it's um, like, this is a, a simple one, but you can make it more complex. So you could say, we, I have some gates which take some inputs X that are non-trainable. Remember how we said uh, a equal X equals MP dot array of 0 0.1 and then requires grad equals true. I could have set this one to false and then X wouldn't be optimized after every iteration, only Y. Uh, so I can decide which ones are my inputs. Sometimes you have data that you don't want to modify after every iteration. They're, it's your data, your data points. And I can distinguish that from my parameters or my weights. So if you come from the machine learning field, you're gonna talk about data and weights um, or, you know, yeah, basically trainable, sorry, non-trainable and trainable parameters. Um, here's another picture of how this can look. At the beginning, you can have um, fixed gates. So these are Y gates, Y rotations have a fixed angle. Then you have you can have some parameterized layers, uh, which take, in this case, angles again. This is a Z rotation uh, that can be modified after every iteration. Uh, it's a new circuit being generated every time with different parameters. You can have C knots, which entangle uh, one qubit. Well, they they can be used for entangling. The C knot itself doesn't do entangling, uh, but you can use it together with Hadamard gates for entangling, for example. They help you transfer information uh, between the qubits. Um, and finally, you can have, again, more parameterized layers, uh, different kind of gates, whatever you want. You are not, um, you're not forced to measure every single, every single qubit. You sometimes only want to measure the output, the first one, and that is totally okay. So here, uh, what the blue box indicates is a measurement on the Y axis. So you see this little Y at the bottom we're measuring on the Y axis. So this would uh, represent a variational circuit where every time that I run it, I run it for different parameters data, and then I get hopefully closer and closer to the answer that I want. And this will be given by my cost function. So if we're looking into uh, quantum machine learning, for example, uh, this is going to be uh, often uh, using a uh, gradient, not necessarily always, uh, but gradients turn out to be a very, very good way of doing optimization and doing machine learning. You want you can do function fitting, you can do classification, uh, you can do regression. There's so much you can do in a similar way to what you do with a classical machine learning model. In this case, uh, the difference is that you don't have a neural network, you have a quantum circuit uh, that you can plug and play together with your um, with your classical workflows. Um, we don't have a lot of time, so we we'll, won't dig into this. But there are specific ways. Oh, I see that there is a question. The quantum circuit replaces a neural network. It sometimes can, but not necessarily. It can work together with. 
So you can have a neural network, then a quantum circuit, and then another neural network. I will show you an example of how this can look. Um, so it can be part of your part of a hybrid workflow. You can think of it as a hybrid network. Uh, that's the most common approach. Um, uh, there's another question. Okay, yeah. Um, the parameter shift rule is a way of getting gradients on quantum hardware. So we're so used to be able, able to find gradients on classical uh, problems, but it turns out that finding a gradient on quantum hardware is not so obvious. And you actually cannot use backpropagation on a quantum circuit. So we use something called the parameter shift rule, which is analytic, it's exact. It can give you exact gradients. And basically, uh, Penny Lane, which is built with differentiability at, as the source, as like a key element, um, Penny Lane has what we call gradient recipe. So for each one of the gates, we know the gradient recipe uh, so that when you want to calculate the gradient, we can get a parameter, you can use the parameter shift rule to give it the gradient. So you don't have to worry about this. Penny Lane does this under the hood for you, uh, but it's good to know that you cannot do back propagation on quantum hardware. You're limited to, for example, finding a differentiation, which is not great. You can have a lot of errors propagating there. Uh, so this is why parameter shift can be very useful. Parameter shift is slower. So if you are uh, running on a simulator, you don't necessarily want to run on parameter shift rule because it will be slower. Uh, it's better to use back propagation or adjoint differentiation as well, which is really good. And actually for the lightning suite, adjoint works best. So for the lightning, uh, lightning qubit and lightning GPU, um, I would recommend using adjoint. Um, there are different algorithms for whatever it is that you want to do. So for quantum chemistry, for example, uh, you can use uh, algorithms that use Gibbons rotation. So this is a very chemistry thing. I don't know if there are any chemists here, but you often want to calculate the ground state energy or the dissociation energy of a molecule. And so you'll, you will um, start with a hard to fog state very often and then optimize from there. Um, Gibbons rotations, for example, can allow you to, um, to get better results. So this is something that you can use as part of an algorithm. Um, there are many others. Uh, algorithms is, is such an open field. We have a lot of tutorials on that. Uh, some of the newest ones are QSVT, quantum singular value transform. Uh, very interesting. Uh, one of the most famous ones, quantum phase estimation. Uh, if you have to learn one, I would recommend you learn this one because it's a base for others such as Shor's algorithm. And Shor's algorithm is the one um, that everybody has heard of, which and uh, found a way to break RSA encryption. However, that's not going to happen today. It's very, very far into the future. Right now, we're at the stage of being able to factor the number 21, maybe. So we're not, we're not so far as to factoring um, hundreds uh, of bits. Um, are there any software packets that implement VQC? I mean, use qubit. Uh, so, so Penny Lane, for example, what we're using, it can be used to implement variational quantum algorithms. Actually, the code that you just ran is a variational quantum circuit. Uh, it's running on a simulator, but if you connect it to a quantum computer, which you can do online, uh, then you can run examples on on an actual quantum computer using virtually the same code. You change one line, the line where you define the device. You have to implement the plugin. You have to have access to the computer, but you change just the line for the device and that's it. That's basically it. Um, so you could run that. So if I didn't understand the question, feel free to, to ask it in a different way. Uh, but yes, uh, Penny Lane is, is an example of a software package that you can use to implement variational quantum circuits using both qubits and simulators. And talking about Penny Lane, um, it's based on Python, easy. It's open source. 
Uh, so please go uh, check out. You can give us a star on GitHub. It's built with differentiability at the score and it's modular. And so, uh, well, this part uh, you you already know, right? You can import your data, import your parameters and use this Q node, which encompasses everything that is quantum and you get the classical output, but then you can connect it with the different kinds of hardware. So these are some logos, so uh, different types of hardware on simulators and classical is the case. So for the person who was asking about, um, can you use this together with um, classical neural networks? You can, and you can, for example, create one with PyTorch and then integrate a quantum node and then uh, integrate another classical and another quantum one, et cetera. Um, Penilene has several functions that are um, designed to make it easy for you to do quantum computing. So we have something that we call templates and the templates are basically condensed lines of code that help you do something that you wanna do many times. Yeah, so you don't have to use a for loop and generate, uh, you know, describe everything exactly. Uh, you can use templates that can help you embed your data, for example, in a quantum computer or process it in a certain way. And it has automatic differentiation at its core. So it's very well posed, very well designed for variational circuits and others, for example. Mm, in terms of simulators, we have used Lightning Qubit. We will use Lightning GPU. And there are others such as default qubit, uh, default mix when you have uh, noisy, uh, when you have noisy circuits, you would use default mix. And default caution is uh, really if you're focused on photonic systems, for example. Now, this is what the person who was asking about the hybrid algorithms was asking. You can connect them together. And so I could start with a classical, uh, a quantum computer, which is represented at the right with a green, green blob. I can have some classical processing. I could have a, a classical neural network. Um, I could connect part of it to a different kind of quantum hardware. So this is what the second green blob is uh, representing. I could connect this to a different kind of quantum hardware. And then I can connect everything back together and get an output. This is all possible with Pendulum. And more than that, we have a huge community. So uh, Viral, again, is uh, helping the community. Uh, we create events. Our signature event is called QHack. It happens in February. Uh, so uh, definitely note it in your calendars, uh, QHack February. Um, and we have a, a forum uh, where we answer questions every day. We have a Slack where the community um, yeah, gathers. Uh, we have a Discord. Uh, it's uh, it's really a very vibrant community and people are super fans of Penelene. So definitely uh, something to be very, very proud of. I feel that Penelene is not only a library, it's a place to gather. And if you go to penelene.ai, you will see it's amazing. The website has um, interactive coding challenges. Um, it has uh, really top-notch tutorials. It's excellent. So in terms of uh, high performance, so, okay, let me, maybe before we go into high performance, uh, is does anybody have an, a question? I'm in the room. Yeah, maybe I had one actually. Okay. Do you have any integrated support for implementing things like uh, lattice models on any lane? You know, I... say say what you do like a you know a hybrid model, an extended hybrid model or something. We, or something we have we have some um, data sets for the Hubbard model for some spin system models. Uh, we have some data sets for that. Uh, I don't know what extra support we have for that, but let me let me ask actually. Um, actually, if you if you 
contact us on the forum or on Slack or via email, you can email me and I can and I can answer that because I know that we have uh we have um data sets for that, but I don't know if we have any other additional support. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so Lightning Qubit, Lightning GPU, I've mentioned them. As uh, you could guess, Lightning Qubit is for CPU. Lightning GPU is for GPUs, works with NVIDIA. So this is why we need to install that cool quantum line. Uh, we also have Lightning Cocos, uh, which is for the, you know, everything that Cocos supports. They have their own, you know, particular, uh, use cases so i would recommend for everything that requires under 20 qubits use lightning qubits it also works on for different platforms if you need more than 20 qubits and your problem is specifically posed in a way uh, that uh, you know gpu can help uh, for example if you have several observables you could batch it over multiple gpus then Lightning GPU is uh, is your way to go. Um, and Lightning Cocos, if you if you have you know AMD GPUs instead of NVIDIA ones, for example, then you might want to use Lightning Cocos. Um, but it's very important here. It's not always better to use a GPU than a CPU. If you have less than twenty qubits, using a GPU will be slower. And if you have to do a lot of back and forth between the GPU and the CPU it will be slower. So you have to be careful about when to use GPU and when to use CPU. And this will really depend on, on the problem that you have. Um, so for, for very large circuits that you, yeah, for very large circuits, then the GPU might help you. Um, but you may need to also like do some specific optimizing as well. Um, this is an old graph. This is from uh, a relatively like not so new version of Penny Lane, but it can show you how for a specific problem with a different number of threads, uh, you can find a performance improvement. So on the vertical axis, you have a time in a logarithmic scale. Um, and so you can see that as you get to 27 qubits, it, really important improve the performance when you use uh, a GPU, for example. Mm, I see there's another question. All of are all of these simulators, classical hardware simulating quantum hardware using the governing equations, how much actual quantum hardware is in practical use? Good question. Um, so the ones that I showed before, they are all simulators. So let me actually go back. These are all simulators and the ones I showed before, well, I'm going too, too much back. These are all simulators working on CPUs and GPUs. So if something is not a simulator, we would say it's running on a QPU, quantum processing unit. Right? Um, there are many quantum devices available. And so this is why we'll also partner, let's say here, you see we partner with AWS. AWS, AWS bracket. Um, if you have access to that, you can have access to the hardware of many different providers. Um, and then through the different plugins that we have, you can access to, um, yeah, like the hardware of the providers that you see in the right, but you have to request the access yourself. So for example, if you want to do a access the IBM hardware, you would have to go into the website and log in and get your API token and access the devices that they have online. But you can use, once you have that, then you can run your pin in link code and just change the device and, and it runs. So you can, you can absolutely do that. Uh, for AWS, uh, again, you would need to get the AWS account uh, and then you change whatever device you want to use. So you can use quantum hardware. Now beware, the AWS gives you a certain number of credits for free, but you cannot let this run forever because it will cost you a lot. So be careful on 
how you're using your AWS credits and turn off your instances. Um, IBM, if you want to use their hardware, you have a queue and you will have to wait for hours if you want to use their actual hardware. So it's usually better to try out everything in a simulator. And then when everything looks like it's working the way you want, then try to run it on, a, on actual hardware. And you'll notice that the hardware is very noisy. It won't give you the results that you expect because, uh, because of the inherent noise in the machine. So uh, it's something worth trying. So definitely try it out if you have access to, to any of these providers. Um, but uh, yeah, just be aware that it might not be exactly what you expect. Um, so there are other tools that you can use that uh, can enhance the performance. So circuit cutting is one that is uh, uh, built in Penilene. You can use a automatic circuit cutting so that if you're running into memory issues, if you're running out of memory, then um, your circuit gets uh, basically broken apart into smaller uh, pieces that are easily more easily run. This has a, a classical overhead. So let's say you're running a, you want to run a quantum circuit, but you only have a two qubit quantum computer. You could run this three qubit quantum circuits by breaking this basically into two, but you would have to do more run on your classical computer that is, you know, running the whole thing. Um, but this is an option that can help you save memory, for example, when you run into memory issues. And this was used to simulate an algorithm called QAOA, so um, Quantum Approximate Optimization Algorithm. Uh, it was used to run over 100 qubits, which is huge. This is a huge number. Um, so definitely um, uh, like a, a, a huge thing that you can do if by using circuit cutting. Um, now going into the last little bit of the presentation before we go into the next demo. Um, compilation is important, right? So you write your program in Penny Lane. Then there are different tools that uh, translate that into some uh, low level um, runtime. We have, we're now developing a new uh, hybrid compiler. It's called Catalyst, so it's not here, but we are developing a new one. Um, so you can actually already uh, look for Catalyst. Um, but yeah, basically uh, the idea is to optimize the compilation of quantum circuits so that they can run better either on simulators or hardware. Um, there are like a lot of specific details. So for you coming from the HPC world, this will make a lot of sense how everything has to be broken apart. Like not everything is run in the exact same way. Um, and this also explains a little bit why all of this uh, back and forth from GPUs takes so long. You have to like um, get your instances running, etc. So. Uh, only useful if you actually have very large uh, circuits that you need to run. Um, and finally, well, it's easy to, to change from one device to the other. This is what I was mentioning, to just change the device from Lightning Qubit to Lightning GPU or Lightning Cocos or something else if you want. So let's go to the second demo. Uh, let me know if there are any questions before we go into the second demo. No? Okay. So. Okay. Um, let me see. Oh. I got disconnected. Okay, so give me a second. I I reconnect. So everybody, everybody reconnect to your system. Everybody reconnect to your system. 
make sure to ask any questions you have also. So if you need any, like I, I can recopy the, do you need me to recopy the, the things that you needed to run? Maybe that's better. Let me copy them here in the chat. So you would need load uh, CUDA toolkit. Um, then you can run this one. And then You can run this one to get access to the node. Is everybody here already? Yeah, I see one thumbs up. How about everyone else? Room's okay. Yeah? Okay. Awesome. So we're gonna create a, a, another example. So We're going to import our favorite library again. So import Penny Lane as QML. So everybody remembers the next one we need to import. Yeah. Come on, I need the energy. <laughs> Come on, everyone, you can do it. What's the next one that we need? From any line? Yes. From any lane. And uh, the import, NumPy. Yes. As MP. I see someone writing in the chat. Yeah, perfect, Jared. You got it. All right. So we're going to define the device. We're going to use uh, the chat transforms the word ah, NumPy. Ah. <laughs> um, so uh -huh. now we're going to define the device and we're going to use the GPU device. So we're going to say, Board members, what goes next? Somebody remembers how you define the device? Yes. ML the device. And then we have Lightning GPU. Uh, wires equals, and this is the number of qubits that you want to run. So this times, why don't we run a lot of qubits? 
So we started with one and two qubits. Uh, let's try running 20 qubits. 20 qubits is a lot. So let's try it. If, uh, if everything breaks down, we can try less qubits, but we should be able to run 20 qubits. Uh, what goes next? How, how do I, um, what do I need to do before I create my circuit? The decorator, yes. Add QML dot Q node of def. And actually here it is uh, where I can um where I can add I can add more information if I want to. For example, I can say diff method equals, how can I say, adjoint. This is adjoint differentiation. It works very well, very fast. I recommend it. Um, you don't have to. If you don't do that, then Penelene chooses uh, whatever it considers to be the best method for the device that you have chosen. Um, so this is an uh, optional keyword argument. Now we define our circuit. So def circuit. And um, this time we will have some parameters that we will call just parameters. Uh, now we can use templates. So let's use one template. It's called strongly entangling layers. So QML dot strongly entangling layers. And we can say the weights for this template. So as you can imagine, it's creating a lot of layers that are strongly entangling. So it has a lot of entanglement between these layers. Uh, but it also receives some parameters, which are the, it takes input the name of weights, right? So weights equals parameters. Um, and um, actually, so wires equals, and this is a range, it's several wires. We're gonna apply this on, a lot of wires, in this case, 20 wires, right? We have 20 qubits. We're going to apply these strongly entangling layers over my 20 qubits. Um, I can actually uh, parameterize this. Oh, I can say uh, num wires equals 20. And uh, that makes it easier if I need to change this. So let's change this here from 20 to num underscore wires. And so here at the bottom, I can also change this to num underscore wires. That way, if I need to change the number of wires, it's gonna be easier. It's already all indexed to the number of wires. Okay. Um, we have a, um, we now have a bunch of gates. So we have a template that is applying a lot of gates here. And now I need some measurement. So I'm going to say return. I'm going to say uh, ml.expval. Um, I'm going to say, uh, again, let's, Actually, let's let's return. Why don't we return the uh, expectation value for all of these? Let's return the expectation value for all of these. So let's return. Um, actually, I need QML dot math dot h stack math.
so here we're gonna return uh, a bunch of uh, a bunch of uh, expectation values, and we're gonna stack them there. So we're gonna create here. Um, QML dot exp val or QML dot poly z on wire i for i in range of num wires. Okay, so I know this may have been a little bit confusing, but I am basically going to return, um, I'm going to, oh, sorry, I am, hmm. I'm going to return an expectation value here. The expectation value on the poly z axis for each wire. So for each qubit, I'm going to return the expectation value on the z axis. This is this is what I'm doing. And I'm putting them all in a list and then using method hstack. And I missed one parenthesis. Ah, I missed it here. Okay. All good. I can copy this uh, after it runs. I can copy this in case in case you made a, a mistake or you need something. Something good that we have is um, we can uh, set a specific shape that we want for those uh, layers. So we don't have to create. Uh, so it's an easy way, basically, to create an initial version for those parameters. So you can say the shape is equals to QML dot strongly entangling layers, right? So dot shape. So for that template that I use, I can get the shape. And the shape will depend on the number of layers. So n layers equals, let's say we're gonna have five layers. And uh, n wires, n underscore wires equals uh, num underscore wires. All right, so we have the shape for the parameters that we're going to create. And now we're going to create the weights. So weights equals np dot. Um, array uh, dot random dot random and the size is going to be equal to shape. Okay, perfect. So now we have an initial value for all of my weights. Um, and finally, I can. Uh, let's say uh, at the beginning, I'm just going to to run this. Let's just run my circuit. Uh, for those weights, um, let's print the value for that. Let's print the value. I'll put it here. Okay, so let's see if it runs. Um, May take a while because I have twenty qubits. So okay, it was actually fast. So here is the output, the expectation value for all of those qubits. Um, it's it's printed out there. So honestly, it was very surprising. It printed it out very very quickly. Usually running a a twenty qubit 
uh, a 20 qubit circuit is like, it's hard, it takes a long time. Uh, something that you can do to compare uh, how much time it, it takes to run something, you can use uh, time it, you can use time it, let me write it here. So you can run, let me, let me add it to the example. So here at the beginning, you can add from time it's import. Timer, as uh, timer, and then you can you can uh, time the execution of your circuits. Um, so yeah, you could uh, you could run this, for example, several times. Um, so you could say uh you're going you're going you can run this a single time too um so you can say um start start equals timer mm -hmm. so this is starting the timer and then after you have done your calculation you have um you have end equals timer and you can print and minus start and here you can see how long it took for you to run something so let's see Okay, so I got the answer at the very end. It took 0 0.07 uh, seconds to run this. If I had a more complicated calculation, so I could calculate um, a, a gradient, I could have uh, more layers, I could have more, you know, could have more, it could take longer. So some things you can do in your HPC system to make everything run faster. You can change the number of threads, so you can uh, export up non threads. So here you can, I don't know if you can see it in the screen, but you can export up up non threads, and then you can change the number of threads to whatever you want. I guess you're you're the HPC expert, so something that you can try is changing the number of threads if your circuit is running too slow. Um, or the other thing that you could do is try um, running on running batches. So uh, let me let me show you an example of batching. Uh, here you have um, you can say batch obs equals true and you can batch the observables and you can adhere to the Q node so comma batch obs um, equals batch underscore obs oh sorry wait uh, no, sorry, at the moment of creating the device, um, I'm putting it in the wrong place. Here, at the moment of creating the device, uh, you have batch obs equals batch, well, you can say it's true. All right, let me delete it from here. Okay, um, so in this case, we're using Lightning GPU and we can use batch ops.
So let's run our example again. In this case, I don't think you'll get a lot of improvement. It's already running very fast. Uh, actually, it runs slower. Uh, this is a good learning, <laughs> a good thing to learn. It's not always going to run faster. Uh, probably, you know, it was already running pretty fast and batching the observables is just uh, taking longer. It can, like using several GPUs in this case will take longer. So um, yeah, that's life. It was running very fast and I made it slower by trying to batch uh, the, yeah, the different observables into a different GPU. Um, so these are two, an example of two little things you can change if, you're, if your circuit is running very slow. If it's running fast, I wouldn't even bother too much. So if whatever computation you're running is running fast enough, um, you can keep it like that and try to improve on, on other things and, and getting more precision or something. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing now. Uh, this will speed up, uh, yeah. This will speed up if you have multiple GPUs as it moves from one execution to many. Mm -hmm. One GPU will slow down with batching, yes. So um, I'm going to stop sharing now. Um, I'm going to share the last couple of slides. Um, so just to show you what comes next. So now you have tried now you have tried <laughs> running uh, circuits on uh, simulation. Uh, the next thing you can do is trying it on hardware. So I've showed you, uh, I've mentioned some examples of where you can run, how you can run on hardware. I would recommend first try uh, getting used to running on the simulators and then try it on the hardware and compare and see uh, how the results change. Make sure to always choose the right tools for the job. Not all problems can be solved faster with quantum or with GPUs. So you have to use the right tools. You can use uh, optimization techniques if you want, like the, the ones that you know from uh, HPC computing. Um, and you can use some uh, techniques that are uh, methods that are already in the quantum library, such as circuit cutting, uh, that can allow you to sometimes uh, not run out of memory, for example. There are some problems within chemistry or machine learning, for example, that can be good candidates for solving with quantum computers, um, but this will really depend on the application. So if you're in the energy sector, I'm sure you'll can, can find problems that are very hard to solve with classical computers. Now, it's often a bottleneck to put the data into the quantum computer, it takes some time, so um, you have to think about the different applications, try them out, see see how they work, and fine tune it. And if you're in uh, trouble, uh, simplify the code and ask us questions. Uh, the community is very happy to to answer us, included, and many people in the community are excited to be able to contribute back to help you to solve these complicated problems, which will uh, benefit us all as a whole. So where can you learn more? Uh, the Xanadu Quantum Codebook, you can find it at codebook.xanadu.ai. Mm, it includes a lot of content on introduction to quantum computing, but also algorithms and error correction, different topics that you may be interested in. Uh, so here, uh, the, I have a picture of the Grover search algorithm, which is very famous, very important. We have YouTube. So if you're more a visual person, uh, Go to our YouTube. We have two YouTubes, the Xanity YouTube and the Penny Lane YouTube. So at Penny Lane AI, the Penny Lane one is new and it's super fun. Definitely uh, go check it out. You're going to have a lot of fun. You're going to learn a lot. We have tutorials as well there. And then PennyLane.ai. Penny Lane is the way, <laughs> the place to go. Uh, if you forget everything else, that's okay. I understand it was a lot, but at least remember, go to PennyLane.ai. That is where you will find all of the links, all of the information, um, all of the tutorials. The, tuto the demos that are on pennylane.ai are a little bit more advanced than the ones that you will find in the codebook. Uh, so if you're starting, go to the codebook. Uh, you can also find the link to that on pennylane.ai. 
And uh, if you liked learning about quantum computing, join us. Our residency program is our main internship program. So if you have students that you want to share this with, um, the residency is for students. And if you're already in the workforce, the careers page is the one for you. Um, so definitely uh, check out the different uh, openings that we have available. Um, we're, you know, we are open to a lot of different uh, profiles and we change all the time. We are looking for new people all the time. So uh, definitely uh, check every now and then. Uh, whatever is uh, uh, posted today is not the same as tomorrow. I join the community. Uh, you can start with Slack. You can scan the QR code or join our newsletter. And this will give you the main information. It's just once a month, a really, really good newsletter. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, thank you for hanging on uh, several hours today to learn about quantum computing, uh, to learn how to use it on an um, HPC setting as well. Uh, we tried out um, different examples and there's a lot more to try. So um, let me know if you liked it. And uh, I hope I'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. And um, we'll be, uh, Lippy and I will reach out for maybe uh, you sharing the recording and any other materials. But yeah, thank you. Um, this was a great tutorial. I found it really helpful. You asked great questions. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it was challenging to go from no quantum computing to running hard problems here. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess the problem I chose was uh, um, running faster than I expected. Uh, the previous time I ran it, it took longer. <laughs> um, so definitely the challenge is for you to look for those hard problems um, that where you will use you know, those HPC resources that you have uh, you're really privileged to be able to have them to try out uh, your complicated problems. I think everybody in the world is uh, jealous of everybody who has this access who can try out um, how to run their quantum programs in an HPC. Yeah, um, I took a quantum computing course in grad school way back in 2006, 2007. Maybe if you were an uh, instructor, I might have gone that route for research. Oh, I'm glad. Thank you. Thank you for the compliment. Well, I hope somebody here leaves um, with a little bit of intrigue of how to learn more about quantum computing. Um, Definitely piqued my interest again. Yeah, that's that's a goal. Uh, definitely come, come with the expertise that you have. Uh, we need more uh, diverse expertise in the field. Thank you so much. Did anyone else have any other last thoughts? Oh, Pradeep yeah. had a question in the chat about formal courses and certificates. Yeah. So the code book, the one I, I let me let me go back to that slide. It doesn't have a certificate, uh, but it can be very like very good for learning uh, at your own pace. It has both theory and coding exercises. So I recommend you to start with that. Uh, at Xanadu, we don't have any formal certifications, but there are others online and there are courses around the world. I work with a lot of different universities that are teaching quantum computing courses. So if uh, this is something that is interesting for you, I'm sure you will find a, a local university uh, that will teach a course on quantum computing. Um, or if you want to actually let me share my email in the chat um if you have any other specific questions you can you can ask me um uh, yeah i have i have my email there um we for the events that we host so we host q hack it's our main event of the year we do give out certificates uh but for the participants that solve um uh, a number of problems as part of, you know, coding challenges. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Any other questions? Well, thank you everyone um, for staying until now. Um, 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lee. I want to thank Lee who um, helped um, prepare part of the second exercise and was here to to support me in this because I'm, I'm not an PC expert, but I want to give you the best today. So thank you so much to Lee for also um, making this happen today. And to everybody at NERS um, who made, yeah, who made today possible. Thank you so much. You you provided a great tutorial and we definitely hope to have you back for more. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And uh, I guess have a good night. All right, you too. Talk to you soon. Yes.